You're listening to the Teak Nation Podcast, where we strive to educate, inspire, and entertain you with tips and lessons from frauders and friends of TKE. Good day, Teak Nation Podcast listeners. My name is Alex Swinson. I am flying solo on this episode, so I won't bore you too much with my own personal thoughts about the world, the NFL, fantasy football. Uh, if you want those, you can you can text me directly uh, or email me, reach out on social media. I'm not hard to find, but uh, it is... Uh, an exciting, exciting time right now. It's been a little while since we've been back with you and, and done a full episode, I realize, but Donnie and I are both really thrilled about the guests we've been able to bring in, including David Bowley and a couple weeks ago. If you've not listened to that. Please go back and do so. A lot of fun, fun stuff there with Dave. Had an opportunity to be down in Southern California, which as you know, is uh, a favorite of both Donnie and myself. Guess this week, we switched it up a little bit, um, went a little bit outside the volunteer or uh, I guess the uh, international volunteer sphere and brought in a, uh, a friend of mine, Drew Frizzell. Drew uh, attended Leadership Academy with me back way back in the day, long, long time ago. So thought we would bring him in. He uh, has a great story to share. I'm not going to get into it too much and ruin it. Uh, was an All-American track and field athlete, Division Two, 17 All-American honors, a lot of a lot of good stuff going on from Drew, but a lot of uh, a lot of challenges that he faced throughout his life, and, and was kind enough to share those with us and explain what he's doing now and how he's looking to make a difference on Teak Nation and and on the world. So, with that, we will get into it and bring in friend of the show, Drew Frizzell. Frutter, Drew Frizzell. Drew is a graduate of University of Central Missouri. Delta Lambda chapter, uh, had an opportunity to attend Leadership Academy with Drew way back in 2010, which at this point may as well have been 1875. Um, but excited to have Drew tell his story. Uh, big time college athlete, so we can get into that a little bit. And then Drew's uh, gone out and, and started his own speaking business and trying to trying to grow his company right now. So first and foremost, Drew, how is, how is life? How are things going on your end there in, in Missouri? Good, man. Good to be here. I uh, appreciate you having me here, Alex, and um, Teak Nation podcast. Uh, life is good. Life is busy, uh, but it's also productive and um, fulfilling. So I really can't complain. Well, that's good. That's good. I want to I want to start. I want to go all the way back to college because you and, and I remember when when we met at Leadership Academy and I think I was 19 and you were 21, 22, right? I was fascinated at that point by your story. You were a full-time college student. You were a leader in your T chapter. You were a decorated college athlete. And at that point you were a dad. And I just, I'd love for you to talk a little bit about how you managed all of those pieces simultaneously. And, and then even more so how that experience, those four years in college with all of those things going on, helped you prepare you for life after college. Well, you know, Alex, I'll tell you, the, the real thing starts uh, at the age of 16 when I lost my dad in a motorcycle accident. Um, you know, in that moment, uh, I was working on a roof and, um, the police came and, and told me to sit down. And so my whole world changed and I had to step up and basically become the man um, of the house. And, you know, doing that at an early age, it really set the tone for how I was going to handle myself and, and do things. And, um, you know, one of the deals that uh, really came from it was, was just the responsibility to not just myself, but for others. Uh, having a daughter literally on my 19th birthday, um, you know, completely changed the trajectory of where I was going to go to college. Uh, ultimately, it led to the best place on the planet, in my opinion, but uh, that'd be UCM. But um, through my time at UCM, you know, I worked three different jobs uh, at a time around 70 hours a week on top of um, being a, an exec member of Student Athlete Advisory Committee. Um, the fraternity being the his store and the vice president of that, um, you know, but the, the big thing here was time management, but also the support of the people. Um, I was very fortunate to join the most diverse fraternity on campus, which introduced me to 
many different lifestyles and attitudes and learning how to navigate those um, came with its challenges. But because of that, I was able to be successful um, or, or continue to be successful to this day because it opened my eyes to all the different kinds of people that are really out there. Um, and in terms of, you know, the athletic success, there were constant injuries, constant ups and downs on that. But, you know, my dad told me my freshman year that I should be a thrower in track and field and that I could be the best in the world one day. Um, you know, that really drove me and put the fire in me to prove him right. And so, um, you know, fast forward years later and hold the NCAA record for career All-Americans and two-time national champion and multiple time hall of famer for everything. And, um, but it really, what it really truly comes down to is community. They say it takes a village to raise a, raise a kid. Um, hell, we're all kids at heart. Most of us are anyway. And, and we still need that community to this day. And because of the chapter that I was in, because of the alumni support that I was given, that we were given, um, not only were we able to prosper, as a chapter, but we were also able to prosper as people. Well, anyone who listens to the podcast regularly knows that I am just one giant child. So uh, <laughs> you're spot on there. Um, I want I want to hit obviously on the on the athletic career as well because I think there's a lot of lessons there. Before that, though, I, I want to go back and and if you wouldn't mind talking a little bit about you, you mentioned right at 19 years old you had a daughter and that has I think in any any circumstance that has a potential to flip someone's world upside down and you were able to 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 not only be a great dad but still right have all these other things going on what was your what was your mindset when you found out that was happening that that was now going to be your reality and then and then how did you start to piece together, okay, this is what I'm going to need to do to continue to be successful in my life while also making sure that, that I'm raising my daughter and being the absolute best dad that I can. Well, you know, the, the big thing on that is um, when I first found out, because initially, you know, I was a three-time state champion in high school. I was, you know, a blue chip thrower um, in high school, if you, if you will. And, um, so I had a lot of division one offers. Yeah. And so as soon as I found that out, you know, like then it became like, Oh crap. Like, where am I going to go to school? That's close enough, but also good enough that will provide me what I need. Um, and so the attitude was also, okay, I have to provide for my, my family. I have to provide for my child and, so then it started piecing together. I worked at this plastic factory that was like 110 degrees every day during the summer, working 70 plus hours a week. I mean, and, and that was just enough to squeak by. Uh, and then I would come home on the weekends and then work during college. And then I blew my knee out. Then I blew my pec out. So for a four, four or five month period, I couldn't even work. Um, and so there were tough times that came through that, you know, but then. Uh, moving forward, I was able to get a job at Pizza Hut and I was get, able to get a job at the bars and family video. And then I worked, you know, some odd in construction jobs and delivery jobs. And, you know, the I, I was listening to the Brad Bohannon podcast. Uh, you know, he's also a Delta Lamb boutique and, you know, just to kind of roll up your sleeves and get dirty and get to work. Uh, and that, that's basically the mindset, you know, that I had. Um, you can either sit there and complain or you can say, hey, Here's the here here are the solutions that I've come up with. Time to get after it and, and make it happen. And you know because of because of that work ethic that was instilled with, in, in me for my mom and my dad, uh, I was able to provide for my my daughter, but also um, you know lead a successful athletic and college career and professional career. Well, yeah, that I I think the one of the common themes there is, is adversity and, and how we respond to it. And, and it's, you know, it's just as great hearing your story now as, as it was 10, 11 years ago. So thank you for, for opening up a little on that front on the, on the athletic side of things to become, you know, you, you glossed over it and I know you probably try and stay pretty humble about it, but right. 17 time all American. Is that correct? Yeah. yeah. Two, right. Two time national, like all, all of these, athletic accomplishments, uh, not, not to be taken lightly. It takes a tremendous amount of discipline to, to 
create uh, uh, an athletic career like that. And I'm just curious, right? When you think about the discipline that it took, you mentioned some of the work ethic came from your parents, but how is that discipline then worked over into other aspects of your life, be it during college or, or be it right now in, in starting your company? And, and what are you tr- what lessons that you learn through that process, through being disciplined, practicing time and time again, are you now trying to take and pass on to the individuals that you work with? Well, you know, the, the discipline side of it uh, is one piece, but I, I think the ultimate side of it is being kind and, and paying it forward, even when you're in the, um, in the process. So in my Central Missouri Hall of Fame video, the greatest compliment I got from our head coach was that um, I always cared about the team. And so having that mindset of, well, you've got to be selfish to some extent, um, no matter what sport you're playing, because no one else's name goes on you know, the, the wall, if you will, except for yours. Um, but through being able to pay it forward and be supportive and know know the role that you play on the team that you're in or the job that you're in is super crucial. And that's what I talk about in my speaking business is knowing your role. Because when I was a freshman, I played a much different role than I did as a junior and senior. But more importantly, um, tying into that discipline side of it, there's a kind of a put up or shut up kind of attitude you have to have. And all of that goes back to, are you having an attitude of gratitude? Because even though you're what most people would perceive to be a really tough spot to be in, if you can be grateful, even in the darkest moments or the hardest times, you're always going to come out on top. If you continue to stay grateful and stay disciplined, because hard work does pay off, but it doesn't come without, you know, it's setbacks and hard times. But if you surround yourself with good people, if you pay it forward and you're supportive of your team, your employees, your boss, whoever it is, no matter where you are in your life, um, starting your own business and, and understanding that there's going to be bumps in the road, um, that discipline, that gratitude and, and that uh, ability to pay it forward is going to carry you through. And, and I think, I think you got in a little bit to, to my next question, but what caused you to pivot to, to starting this business, to wanting to pay it forward, as you say, as a, as a speaker, what are, you know, what, what, at what point, what was the moment where you said, this is what I'm doing. This is my path forward. And then what are you hoping to ultimately accomplish with this new business and, and by sharing your skills? So on March 2nd of 2020, I went to Warrensburg for a fraternity meeting and kind of back, you know, rewinded a little. I've always wanted to be a speaker. I always knew that my story was good and that a lot of people could take something from it. And more importantly, the skills and the and the values and the lessons that I've learned were going to be impactful and valuable for, for future people. But uh, on March 2nd, I went to UCM and we had a track meeting and I said, and our head coach was like, hey, Drew, you can come. And so the student athletes were com- basically complaining about how the camaraderie, the energy really wasn't there on the team, which was never the problem when I was there. They didn't know each other. And I thought, OK, how can I help this program? Then I go to the fraternity meeting and then I'm talking to the actives and they're talking about how the alumni really aren't involved um, as much as they would like to see. And I thought, well, how can I help these guys? I'm driving home that night and like the light bulb goes off. I'm like, aha. And so then I start kind of bouncing around ideas of like how I can put something together. And um, Jacob Mahan, a fellow T four time All American at UCM shot putter, um, him and I came up with the title of my speech, Transcend Your Track. Um, and so through doing that, um, the, the real the real crux of it was trying to do something to pay it forward to these students and understanding there's a lot of little pieces that I just happen to be really good at that these kids are missing and that even the adults in the room, if you will, are missing. And more importantly, I was building this business because my mom had just recently been diagnosed with cancer. And so I was trying to build something so I would be allowed to be home, to be able to be with her. And unfortunately, this past March, uh, she passed away from cancer. And so 
Um, you know, she had just retired. She retired on February 7th, or her retirement party was February 7th, 2020. February 10th, she found out she had cancer. She spent 38 and a half years at Walmart only to find out basically she had 14 months to live. And so it also pushed me to like, w- when you have a skill set, when you have a purpose, when you have a certain amount of drive, I, I don't care what job it is, what career field it is. If you feel that like deep in your bones, go for it. And luckily for 38 and a half years, my mom worked at Walmart, but she also lived her life for 38 and a half years while she was there. She was still having fun, still being loving, but it really drove it home for me where like I have a, I have a job now that's a six figure paying job and I am truly grateful for that job, but I would much rather make less money making an impact and teaching these young students the right things that they have to have than just make the money because I don't, I don't, I don't need a ton of money. I'm a very simple man. Um, I did buy me a WWE championship belt, like a replica belt, of course, you uh, but uh, you know, but I've, I've got, I've got the rings, I've got the accomplishments. So it's not like something I have to, like, I don't have to prove anything to anybody. Right. right. And all I really want to do is just give back. Well, I, First of all, I'm, I'm sorry to hear about your mom. Um, I also didn't know the story about your dad. And, and so there's a lot that I'm I'm learning about you right now. But um, it just, again, to me, it speaks to your your ability to to work through adversity and, and stay positive and and stay grateful, as you said. Um, so thank you again for for sharing all of that. Uh, the the last last piece I had for you was just on on your involvement with Teak, and, and I know you've touched on some of this, but you've it, it seems like you've gotten a little more involved with the with the chapter there at Central Missouri in the last few years. You've you've continued to help them, whether it be financially or with your time or or with your talent. Uh, what is it that that continues to draw you back to the fraternity? We have a lot of most alumni, as as we were talking about a little bit before this, who go away and, and don't come back, or if they do come back, it's 50 years down the road and, and they're just trying to see what's going on. You've really immersed yourself back in the fraternity on top of all the other things you have going on. What pulled you back to, to talk at Epsilon as a volunteer and, and why do you choose to give what limited time you do have back to the, back to Teak? So I was very involved with the chapter until about 2014. And I had moved to Kansas and was a full-time college coach and then moved to Illinois. Uh, and so I was very separated from just my chapter, but um, I continued to be an advisor for the local chapter, uh, one of the local fraternities, not Teak, but a local fraternity at the Bethany College, and then uh, was an advisor for the Alpha chapter at Illinois Wesley okay. when I was a college coach there. Um, but I... I my time was pretty limited there. And so then when I moved back in 2019 to Missouri, um, you know, it it was never a matter of not wanting to be a part of it as much as it was time, distance and ability. Right. Um, And so, you know, as soon as I got back, it was full tilt, you know, full steam ahead because it, it, again, it goes back to what I was talking about with community. So I drove an 800 mile round trip to meet a guy named Mike Davidson, who's a teak from Delta Lambda, who was who's now the retired vice chairman, uh, chief agency marketing officer of State Farm. I I, he said he had 48 minutes (laughs) to talk to me. And so I said, book me. I'm going to get in my 1995 Chevy Cavalier that smells like Pizza Hut pizza. (laughs) I'm driving to Illinois. And so I met him. He took the time, literally gave me 48 minutes. Um, of his time. And um, I got to sit there and I got to talk to him. I got to learn from him. I met a guy named Bill Parrish, who was the director of Homeland Security after 9-11, who's a teak from UCM. Um, So many great people. Uh, Steve Jenny was a huge part in terms of, of being like kind of the gatekeeper. And so that's kind of the role that I play now is the gatekeeper to the alumni because I was fortunate enough to have a platform to speak to all of these alumni because, you know, successful people hang out with successful people, success breeds success. And so, but I was willing to put in the effort to go meet these guys and to go out of my way to make those connections. And so it's the same 
I, I don't care if you're a potential new guy, you're an active, you're on the fence. I like people. I like to make people better. And if I can share and be an asset to my local chapter or any chapter for that matter, um, I want to be that uh, because I don't just, you know, some guys join and it's like their era or their group and like they're stuck to that group. Um, I, I don't believe in that method. I believe that the um, success of the fraternity is, is a whole thing, not just the time that you're in. And so to be able to give back, to be able to pay it forward to the, the people that are in it, the new ones that are coming in, um, I think is crucial. And for a guy in, in my position with what I have been fortunate to succeed in, for me not to pay it forward and give back is a disservice to not only the chapter, but the fraternity as a whole. Well, I, I appreciate you sharing that because I think it's, I think you're spot on. And, and a lot of alumni probably think that they don't have anything to offer. They don't have any knowledge. They don't have any money. They don't write, they don't have any experience, but just being there and being present can make a huge difference in one or two lives. Right. And that's, that's all it takes. So uh, I'm glad that you have approached your time as an alumnus that way and, and understood that you do have something to give back, right? You do have experience. You do have things that other people can learn from. And, and I know that the guys there at Delta Lambda and, and the other teeks that you've interacted with are, are better off for it. My last, last couple of pieces. Um, one, where can people find you? LinkedIn, Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, all that. We'd love to know that. And then any final messages just for Teak Nation as a whole, for the listeners of this podcast anything that, that you want to share with, uh, with the audience you have? Yeah, so um, I've got my uh, Drew Frizzell coaching page on Facebook. Uh, you can find me on Facebook personally, just Drew Frizzell. Um, Twitter and Instagram is at Coach Drew Frizz, but I I bear I have barely even uh, touched Twitter and, and Instagram at this point. Uh, LinkedIn, the same thing, Drew Frizzell. Um, the best way to get a hold of me is probably through Facebook, and I'm literally on the phone uh, all the time. My my girlfriend Holly says, you know, I, I tell her I said I don't really have any hobbies, and she said, well, your hobby is networking and co staying connected, and so <laughs> um, I stay connected with pretty much everybody in the chapter uh, in some capacity, and so um, so that's the way to find me, uh, and also know that um, I'll get to you for sure. Um, I, I think it's important to to do that, but um, in terms of what do I have to say to the chapters and to Teak Nation, to, to your point. I, so one thing I talk about in my speech, in my speech, and especially to athletic teams and, and, and student athletes and chapters, there's three elements, three, three, three currencies that I consider to be the most valuable. And they just so happen to be the letters TKE, time, knowledge, and energy. Now, we, you know, yes, there's a certain level of finances that we have to have as a chapter and stuff like that, and even as an athletic team or a school, but the two things that everyone has is time and knowledge, no matter what. And so when so many people are stressing about, well, we need money, we need money. No, you don't need a relationship first. Ask someone for their time, a little bit of their time and their knowledge. Everyone's got knowledge in something. It doesn't matter what it is. Everybody's got a golden egg. And so I, I strongly suggest and encourage everyone to go out of their way and ask for people's time and their knowledge. Don't worry about the money. The money will come naturally with relationships, with genuinely making people feel cared about it, that will come. But the most important things are time and knowledge. And so if, if I can leave the podcast with anything, it would be that go after people's time and knowledge, because those are two of the most valuable currencies we have. And if you can build those relationships, the opportunities will show up. The first two jobs I had out of college were with State Farm, yeah. every single job every job I've ever had was solely because I knew somebody. That's it. And so grow your network, make, put other people first, learn from them the best you can and make sure to always give back and do it the right way, do it the teak way and value the time that you have and be present in every moment that you're in. Yeah, that's, I think that's one of the, that's one of the main selling points of being a part of, of our fraternity, right, is, is having the opportunity to meet people like yourself, meet people like the individuals that you talked about, people like our grand council members, the other guests on this podcast, 
I'm in the same boat as you. I, well, obviously the, the job that I have is because of the fraternity, but, um, but so, I mean, all, all of my friends, right. All of my friends, all of my network, all of my connections are a direct result of talk app epsilon. So I think your message is spot on. And, and I hope that our listeners take that to heart and, and take advantage of it. Mm-hmm. Drew, I, uh, I can't thank you enough for, for your time here, um, for your, your wisdom, for sharing your story with us. Certainly, uh, Hope to do it again sometime once uh, once the once the speaking business takes off, right? And uh, and you're you're up there on on stage next to Tony Robbins. We can uh, we can bring you guys in together. Um, yeah. But uh, but yeah, thank you. Really appreciate it. Really enjoyed the conversation, and uh, we'll we'll talk to you again soon, my friend. All right. Till next time, Frater. Absolutely. All right, brother. Take care. You too. And one big final thank you to Drew. Really appreciated having him on, having a chance to catch up. Somebody that uh, I've, again, been connected with for about 10 years now and uh, haven't really had a chance to sit down and talk to until we did that interview. So that was fun for me. Hopefully he enjoyed it, although I'm sure he would never tell me if he didn't. That is all for this week's episode of the Teak Nation podcast. As always, smash the like button, tell a friend, let everyone know you listen to the Teak Nation podcast and how great it was so that they too can experience all of the wonderful content. Thank you for listening. Really appreciate you. And we'll talk to you soon. Goodbye.